What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Archive Podcast. Today, I'm joined with Becca Modabadze, a software engineer at Google. Becca's had a mouth-shattering journey before Google. He started all the way back at the Academy of Arts, followed by major in economics. Then he switched to data science and eventually wrote his first line of code at the age of 29. His outstanding journey makes me super excited about this episode. And it once again proves that it's never late to get into software engineering. And now, without further ado, here it is. My conversation with Becca Modebadze. Enjoy. When did you write your first line of code? I write my first line of code at the age of 29, uh, when, when I was uh, wrapping up with my degree in economics. So in my econom econometrics class, uh, actually my first line of code was written in the programming language called Stata, which is specifically used by the statisticians to run various models. And um, after that, I came to my professor and I asked, um, are there better tools? And he was like, check out Python. I checked out Python and now I'm working as a software engineer. <laughs> cool. Uh Actually, I have like one of my first programming languages was the statistical language as well. It was like R, which was used to oh, do okay. some. We were using it yes. at, at yeah, statistic Data class. Is, so is like way lower level than R. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So that's truly fascinating that you started your coding and software engineering journey at 29. And before we kind of go like above 29 and talk about your software engineering journey, I really want to discuss like what was happening before that, because I truly believe that there are some kind of experiences and some skills that you and I both experienced, which kind of made us better maybe, or made us software engineers eventually. So can you just talk a bit about your journey before 29, what you were doing, et cetera? <laughs> That's a, that's a very, very broad question. I think there be, there can be a whole podcast episode discussing the, what I've done before that, because I've done a lot of stuff. I started my journey at the Academy of Arts. Uh, I was really hoping to become an architect. I dropped out pretty soon. I started working as a designer, uh, mainly working in 3D, Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, while uh, being a photographer on the side. Then I, I thought that I needed more tangible career that earns money. So I moved into the business, I switched to the business major, um, didn't last that long because again, I found a job, I started working in regular management, this and that. Finally, then I decided that I need to complete my degree, which was in economics. And I was hoping to work with, to combine economics, philosophy, politics, work with the international trade development. Uh, on a theory level, it's very fascinating, interesting. And I always say economics is the best major to discuss in a bar of a beer. Uh, but in practice, it's not as fascinating. You're just doing tedious stuff, um, routine things in spreadsheets. So I got, um, I got really boring pretty much uh, through first couple of jobs in banking. And then uh, in my economic, econometrics classes, I said, uh, well, I, I got introduced to the Python through Python then SQL, then I learned about the data science and uh, econometrics is very close to data science. The statistical and mathematical principles are uh, very similar. The approaches are different. So, and the data science was like really starting to take off. There were like articles, data science being the sexiest job, this and that. So, you know, the marketing. It got me too, and um, I switched to data science. I started working as a data scientist for a relatively uh, small government contracting company in the U.S. I uh, was working with the uh, like healthcare claims, investigations, and prevention of fraud. And while I started doing that, I also got accepted at the uh, University of Pennsylvania um, to do my master's in computer science. And the reason I got into the uh, master's in computer science because I wanted to be just a better programmer for data science, but I saw myself growing as a data scientist more. I was not even considering software engineering. But, like first term into my master's program, I realized that what I liked about this data science was actually programming. So I was like, let me program more and do statistics less. And I made a switch. Um, 
um, to software engineering and since that you know, I've been here. Great. And I really want to go like one layer deeper in terms of some skills and interests people have before they get introduced to software engineering or any other engineering fields like data science maybe as well. So uh, I'd like to share one of my experiences like uh, back then in my university days, I was majoring in electrical engineering. I'm not majoring in computer science as well. So uh, I just then kind of pivoted to that. But like, I was like very, very bad listener during lectures. I had some focus issues and the whole learning process of my bachelor studies happened like during night in my room with me, with books, etc. <laughs> I did like literally like almost couldn't listen to the lectures. And at that point, uh, the skill which I developed during those years was kind of self-learning and the ability to figure things out with myself. And it turned out when I got into software engineering, I really felt that I already knew how to learn new things. And it was kind of really kind of exciting. And I, I felt really strong and confident in that. And can you share those kind of skills from your first life, which you think made you a better software engineer or made you a software engineer at all? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, so first, what is a software engineering? A lot of people, a lot of people equate software engineering with programming or coding. So programming coding is just a skill. It's a tool, right? You use to solve problems. Software engineering is problem solving. So you just use different set of tools to solve different type of problems. Um, so the software engineering starts with your mindset that, uh, okay, you're in a field, like when, for example, when you're in electric engineering, you are also solving problem that relates to electrical engineering and use tools that relate to electrical engineering, right? And similarly, when you're in software engineering, you, you, you solve the similar problems that relate to the field. So my previous experience where it helped me the most to become a good software engineer was that my attitude that, okay, there are problems to be solved. And given the circumstances, I need to understand uh, what is the problem, uh, what are the tools necessary for this problem to solve, and then solve it. Uh, like, for example, when I was working, when I was in a business, right, uh, in a middle management, again, we had certain metrics, we had certain goals we need to achieve. Uh, my tools were back then team, my team, right, my uh, product that was warehouse somewhere, and I would use this too. Okay, which which products do I need to push more? To whom should I assign uh, to close deals? This and that, right? I'll I'll think about how can I achieve that. I mean, I transferred the similar mindset in software engineering. So I I start thinking in a similar way. What what are the available resources right now? What kind of problems we're trying to achieve? So this 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 goes the long way. Um, and I realized that software engineering was not, I, I mean, I love programming. I love, I can sit the whole day and I can, I can just write the code, but it, it's, it's more than a code. And I see, especially at Google right now, and I see more senior people, they write less code, but they solve way more, uh, problems with a bigger scale and how they think about it, how they approach it. Um, so any kind of your life experience, like getting out of any challenging situation, whatever you learn there, whatever skills you develop, it can be transferable to the software engineering because you, you will need to figure it out. Yeah, great. Okay. You just mentioned that you love coding and I have no <laughs> doubt in that for sure. And can you like more generalize and tell me what do you enjoy doing throughout the day? What is this part of this field where you at, which makes it so exciting for you? I consider myself a builder. Uh, so even as a kid growing up, my favorite toys were Lego toys, Lego blocks. So I like to build things. And, and, and especially like, I would ask my parents to buy me Legos, right? And they will buy me these blocks and it comes with instructions what to build, right? And I will always disregard that and use my imagination to build things. Uh, and it was the, uh, the the most entertaining part for me. So I, 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 and that's why actually I got into the architecture too, because I saw myself as building things, mainly like buildings, right? Uh, but I felt the same way with the software engineering. You have a building blocks, right? You have these libraries, frameworks, programming languages, database, whatever you have. And you have to 
pick the perfect blocks uh, and fit them together to build something useful, right? something that, that functions, uh, something and, and, and uh, it, it solves a problem for someone. Um, the way I look at it is that um, what excites me and inspires the most is seeing people use my, my product. Uh, and uh, another thing that I love about software engineering, it's very deterministic, right? Um, if you claim something, if you claim something, it's provable. Okay, if you say that, okay, this is going to work this way, it should work that way. You cannot just bullshit your way through it. So it, sh it should work and it should work and you can measure it, how efficient it is, and you can compare. So people, people just can't get away through like buying and boasting and you know this and that. It, everything, every word can be proved with your code. So I love, I love the fact that it's deterministic. I think it's a hard science, uh, which is a very important aspect of progress and, and it should serve people. It could serve to solve our problems and improve quality of life. And me being one of the contributors to it, doing my part, it's honestly excites me. Cool. Okay, now let's make this giant leap in our conversation and let's jump directly into Boon. <laughs> okay, just kidding, not Boon, but <laughs> Google. So uh, <laughs> let's let's let, let me ask about the goal setting the goals. In general, okay, not in particular Google this time, but can you elaborate more about how you, do you set goals? How do you f maybe make plans which you follow to achieve those goals in general? And then maybe let's lean towards Google part. Uh, so there, uh, I mean, there are various strategies you can utilize. I personally try to balance between what is in demand right now and what offers good opportunities and what I like. Uh, I cannot force myself to do only things that are important, but I'm not enjoying it. Similarly, when I'm doing things that I'm enjoying, but I don't see much perspective in it, I kind of lose interest uh, because at the end of the day, I have to pay bills. Um, so I'm trying to, trying to find the balance there. It's, it's very important. Um, so I usually, I mean, follow the trends, uh, what's going on on the market, like Right, right now we have this AI boom, right? Everybody is looking into it. And it's really, it's not, not that hard to get started with it. And it has a lot of useful application. Um, I was very skeptical of rise of NFTs. Uh, and I, I honestly, I never got into it. Um, now we have even bigger boom about the AI, but you can see the usefulness of AI, how, many, how much it accelerates our productivity and how many amazing products that we built with it. So yeah, I got, I got instantly interested in it, explore a little bit more. Um, and then at the same time, I have to do certain things that are simple engineering, right? I, uh, even, even if whenever you go, it doesn't matter if it's Google, or whatever company is, they're the tasks you need to complete. Like 80% of your work are those like debugging, writing tasks, this and that. So understanding the importance of it, that this, this kind of daily task lead you to doing meaningful work at the end of the day, it kind of keeps me going. And the second thing is I'm always communicating with it's my manager or whoever it is. So we are aligned and I align on two things. One thing is what are the uh, company's priorities and what my manager wants me to uh, devote more time to so we can find the balance. It's not that I don't want to be like selfish and only think about what I want, but at the same time, I need to leverage the company strategy and the things I like to work on. So having a good communication with with your um, peers or superiors uh, that that that's a that's going to serve you well in terms of like growth. Um, and the second part of it is actually you can you can excite yourself about certain things, right? Um, there were there were aspects of project that where I was not too much excited about it. But then I realized after several conversations and like attending some of the calls that those parts of the project are actually very critically important things. Um, and I started thinking, if I can solve this kind of problem, which is very important for the company, which is very important for, the, for my team, right? I'll get a better recognition, I'll get a better trust. And after that, I can, I can actually choose some of the projects, I can lead the projects, so it kind of inspired me again to do something useful for others. Uh, so you can find the inspiration, even the things that initially you think 
are not that exciting or attractive uh, if you understand the importance of those things. If, but you have to question, I always question things. Okay, why do you want me to work on Why do you think this is priority, right? There could be reason. Any kind of, it's not an authoritative regime here. Uh, anytime some, any um, directions come in, it needs to be questioned so everyone understands and are well aligned uh, what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. Okay, cool. And now can you tell me like about the process of maybe applying, searching for some jobs at Google and getting there? And then let's continue about life at Google. But first, let's talk about that. How you got there? Uh, it's actually, I started uh, in my second year of my master's program when I started actively interviewing. I was already working as a software engineer but I had the bigger ambitions. I wanted to move Seattle or Bay Area, like California, where the tech boom is happening. So I started actively interviewing. I think I interviewed around like 30 companies, um, some well-known companies among them. I got offer from really well, uh, well-known companies. Uh, I started working at Indeed. Honestly, I, at that moment, I didn't believe that I was technically well-versed to start working at Google. My experience with programming was like two-ish years. Um, and I, I, was, I was still past like fundamentals, but what I was doing, I was building a lot of side projects. And the reason I was building a lot of side projects was just the genuine curiosity. I was not building side of projects to put on my resume. If you go on my GitHub, there's, it's like a graveyard of projects. I started, I think like 200 projects and I barely finished three or four. I'll get like, just curious about the thing, try to build it. I built the shell emulator. I built some image processing system, video streaming, whatever. I, I did so many things. I was just curious and it helped me to actually develop good programming skills. But at the same time, I believe I was nowhere ready to work for the company like Google, which is infamous for its technical needs. So I started working at Indeed and a couple of months in, a um, recruiter from Google approached and um, they offered to interview at Google. Like I had nothing to lose, right? I already have a good offer from Indeed or working here. And then um, I took the interview. Uh, so I, I passed all the rounds and there's a lot of rounds there. And then I started working at Google. Cool. And like one thing which just caught my uh, ear was that you were building side projects out of genuine curiosity and not because you wanted to put them on resume. And that's, I think, one of the most important thing for beginners. Because like when you're doing something only because of you need to add that to your, your resume, you might lose motivation, right? Because curiosity is like the, the biggest source of motivation, especially in the beginning. So that's so cool. Okay. So now you got a Google and it, it, it sounds like it was very easy, but I think it was not that easy. Yeah, yeah, All those rounds. <laughs> It was not easy at all. I actually, so it's so funny. Uh, first round, first round at Google is what's called the phone screening. And during the phone screening, uh, you literally get the phone call and then you log in on Google Doc and that's where you write your solution to the technical problem. And this is like data structures and algorithms question. And um, the question, I actually got a lot of questions related to data structure called trees, which I was very comfortable with, honestly because I use it over and over again in various my projects. Um, and uh, so in a way you can say I got lucky there, um, but then I learned that Google actually likes trees because uh, a lot of implementations here use trees. So the interesting fact about the, my first interview with Google was, so someone calls that that has obvious Eastern European accent, but I cannot see their face. And I'm, I'm, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna say something because all the calls, obviously all the interviews are recorded, I don't want to say something that may jeopardize me. So I'm trying to like, you know, play on the fact that they're from Eastern Europe or something like that. So this guy, he wants on explaining the problem and he's like giving me a question. I'm, I'm answering and typing it out, this and that. And suddenly he tries to explain this tree and he says, okay, this tree, imagine it's like Chuchela. I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what did you say? Did you say Chuchela? He was like, yeah, imagine it's like Chuchela. I was like, oh, okay. But I, I still, you know, don't want to like, don't want to continue to like going deep into the conversation. I don't want to. I don't want to get into the problem that somebody was like, "Oh, you know, they know the guy. That's how he got it." 
So I just ignored it completely. And after we finished the interview, he closed the dog and he said like, oh, my, my wife, I'm, I'm from uh, Ukraine and my wife is Georgian. So uh, when I saw your last name, I realized it was, I was like, okay, he was nice. Uh, actually, when I started working at Google, I reached out to him. We had a couple of nice conversations. So uh, it was very, very uh, pleasant experience. It set me on a positive note to start it well. Uh, and then I had the final round after that, which was, I think I took a one month between those two interviews to prepare well. And on the day of the interview, I woke up and I was honestly, I was so nervous. I, and I, I was telling to myself, Hey, I don't need it. You know, I already have a good job. Indeed is a really good company. I'm with my good team. I was not, I was not feeling ready at all. So I, I told the recruiter that I was not feeling well and I wanted to reschedule it literally like 40 minutes before interview. So I rescheduled it uh, by like two weeks, I believe. And then after two weeks, I woke up again in the morning and I was not feeling at all. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to not show up. <laughs> I don't want to do this. <laughs> and uh, somehow uh, my partner pushed me, to, okay, let's go. You got to do it. I mean, what are you going to lose? Absolutely nothing. So okay. I was like, let me do it. And I'm, I'm really thankful that I did it. <laughs> cool. And <laughs> yeah, I really love like this kind of, uh, exciting and funny stories because yeah it, it 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 would have been like really cool to hear about your Trella during the interview I mean. <laughs> I <was> like, and, <laughs> and to say to our listeners just Trella is like very native Georgian sweet which <laughs> consists of some <laughs> grape juice and nuts and there is no way anyone on earth knows <laughs> maybe about your Trella other than Georgians so <laughs> it would yeah, have been exactly. <laughs> so funny <laughs> okay so now I'm uh I really want to talk about these uh, technical parts and the things you work on at Google, okay? As long as you are mm -hmm. okay to talk on yeah. such topics. So Much maybe you can, can tell share. us a bit. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you can share what you're working on. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. So my, my, actually my experience before joining Google and interest were mainly in distributed systems. Um, and low level programming, for example, I'm huge rust enthusiast. So all my side projects, pretty much I built in rust. Uh, I built the previous company up to the computer vision system in C plus plus. And I like like working on low level stuff. Even and, if it, indeed and it happens was... that Google is doing some, a little bit distributed stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we kind of serve some couple of billion people. So. <laughs> um, and then uh, at Indeed, I also worked on the search engine. So I was part of the core search engine team, which is very technical. I like working on the technical aspect, uh, technical problems, right? That requires some knowledge, uh, mathematics, um, algorithms, this and that. So at the Google, when I got my, so the, the, the process, the hiring process at Google is you, you clear all the interviews, then what, then you, you your package goes to what's called the hiring committee. And there are some people you have no idea who they are. They review your package and they say, okay, let's hire this guy or not hire. So I got the old hires. And after that, you move on what's called team matching. Team matching is a lot of teams that have openings that will pull your package and the hiring managers will check with you if there's a good, but it's not, there's no technical interviews anymore. It's just more a fit. If, if, if there is a fit with the team, with your, like your personal interests and the other teams, whatever they're looking for, then they will give, they will extend you to offer. So when I cleared this hiring committee, uh, I actually skipped the team matching process and one team, it's called the leadership program. So they directly give you the offer without any, like, without even talking to you. So they give you the offer and then you talk to them. So they picked my, my resume and um, through this literature program. And after that, they, they offered me, I was like, yeah, okay, this is interesting. I sp and um, it was, it was already, it was the time like the past COVID when the market starting, started getting bad. So I was also worried that there'll be not as many opportunities. So I was willing to take that. And I spoke with the hiring manager um, and he suggested uh, there were two teams. One was working on the, uh, it, everything was uh, Google Assistant. So one was working on the speaker um, and the other one was working on the Pixel tablet. The Pixel tablet was based on the Android. Um, and uh, I've never worked on Android. I've never worked in Kotlin before that. Uh, but. Because I never worked on Android, I never worked on Kotlin. I decided to take that one. I wanna, I wanted to like, and it sounded more, um, 
larger scope uh, and I, I felt there was more importance to it. So I picked that one. Um, I started working on this. So I joined the team, what was called the infrastructure team for the client. Uh, so we built a client for Pixel tablet to have a voice assistant on it. And uh, my, my project was pretty much, I owned the whole infrastructure that allowed the lock screen experience on Pix, uh, Pixel tablet, which was released last May. Uh, after that, I got reorged multiple times and ended up working in Google TV. That's where I am right now. Google TV is really fast growing area of Google right now. We lead the market of any TV platforms and we have over 100 billion, oh, I'm sorry, 100 million users. And I'm on platform team again. I'm working on two things. I'm working on the account related stuff. So when you make like account switch, add account, keep mode, this and that. So on a, if you own the Google TV on the next update, your accounts are not working. It's most likely I messed up something there. So <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and that's the one thing. And another thing is company's priority is AI. So there are a couple of initiatives, which I cannot disclose right now, but it involves generative AI for a better user experience. I was, I was very active to get this kind of project. I was constantly bugging tech leads that, okay, if there's AI coming our side, so finally it is. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the other thing that I'm actually having a lot of fun with because it involves a lot of prototyping, experimenting. So let's see what comes out of it. And about this, you mentioned that you have switched teams multiple times, right? And how does that happen? Is it like company kind of, asks you to switch team or you can ask and maybe maybe like what happens when you maybe lose some motivation in your current team maybe so what do you do in those cases and you want something new yeah so it's uh, so there are many ways google is a um, really big company and there is a lot of products that people know about and there's a way more that people don't know about there's a lot of internal teams so the the, the, the very interesting aspect about google is it, it only uses the Google internally developed technologies. So we don't use anything that it's not Google developed. Only things that are we using that is open source is the ones that we open source. So whatever, whatever, there's not, a, literally there's not a single thing that we use that is not developed by Google. By Google. So everything obviously needs to be maintained and it's maintained internally. So we have, that's why so many engineers here. So uh, this also comes with pros and cons. Pros is that there's a lot of internal opportunities. So if you get interested in something, you can uh, talk to the hiring manager or the tech lead and make a switch if they get the headcount. So there's a lot of internal mobility, people move teams um, um, and just, just to learn new things, experience new things, it's pretty cool. Uh, but the cons is that often people just leave and they abandon their uh, whatever the libraries or the tools they're maintaining. So you gotta, and you don't have much documentation, so you gotta figure it out what's going on there. Um, so th this one thing that people often utilize is just moving around and try various uh, teams and technologies and product areas and this and that. The other thing is my, my um, re I, I didn't want to change things, uh, but it was due to the restructuring. And uh, last year, Google went through a lot of changes because uh, I think we remember on our strategy. Um, now, Google, we, we've been saying that Google is AI first company for a long time, but now our company's goals align pretty well with this. So the restructuring came with to prioritize certain type of products. So ooh, that's the that's only reason uh, I got moved around. Uh, sometimes it was oh, my whole team moved out. Sometimes it was just my manager moved out and we merged two other teams. Um, so mainly it was due to the reorganizations. And like lately, I've been discussing a lot with my friends. Obviously, I have like a couple of uh, software engineer friends. And we've been discussing a lot about stress situations at our current jobs. I believe this situation might be a little bit better at Google, but I really want to mm. talk a lot now with you about stress situations. What kind of stress do you face at Google? Uh, that's, I mean, there, there are various. Okay. So first is my timing is Google coincided with 
massive layoff. I think it's the first time in Google history when they did such a mass layoff, which was last year in January. They let go 12,000 people, and one of them was my manager, who, with whom I developed really good relationship. We just worked three months together, but we developed. He was uh, he. I mean, he is uh, from Russia, and you know, like there was a lot of cultural similarities that overlapped. It was really easy to build a report, and I felt very comfortable working under him. Or he was very supportive, and suddenly uh he was let go um i was assigned to the his manager skip manager which which had his own a lot of responsibilities and he never had time to me as a newcomer i needed still some support it, he never had the time for that which i totally understand uh so it was a little, a little stressful to navigate but the uh, the the interesting fact is that i went through six manager changes in one year um, it became a norm now to have a new manager every three months, so I kind of got yeah, used to it. Um, and the stresses are various. So stress one is because we had the layoff last year and we had a relatively small layoff this year too. So there's a lot of uncertainty. And the initial communication, which which was public, was that okay, Google will go through certain changes to align with the strategy of being AI first company. And when when you hear something like that, you don't know okay is your team aligned with AI or not, right? So you, you never know what's gonna happen to you. That's one thing. And there's another thing is just internally, um, you have goals, right? We are working on certain projects and and there's a lot of teams involved uh, when you're trying to deliver one project. So you don't wanna be the blocker. So if you have some responsibilities, you wanna deliver in time, but sometimes those, technical challenges, sometimes not even technical challenges, all right, more like logistic challenges can slow you down. So you may stress out about the things that, oh, maybe you're late or this or that. But during this time, and given the fact how many changes I went through it, um, the way I manage is I, re I, I differentiate the things I can control and things I cannot control, right? If if company decides to do the layoffs, I definitely cannot control. It doesn't matter how good you are. If if company just the strategy changes, and it happens that your team doesn't fall under that strategy, right? Um, you, you, there's no, absolutely nothing you can do about it. All you can do about it is when the project is assigned to you, you know, deliver it well. So uh, trying to differentiate between two two like in within the scope of of your life, professional, personal, whatever it is, what are the things that you can control? Concentrate on those things, put your effort there, and just accept the rest. Whatever happens, life is like that. There'll be a bunch of bad things that are gonna happen in our life to us. We gotta be prepared to accept it and keep moving forward. Actually, uh, like if you like put emotions aside and feelings and you just think with your brain, it's pretty straightforward that, and it totally makes sense. But to me, like, for example, where, when I'm in a, this stress situation, it doesn't matter who tells me the words you just said, I just can't get it. And especially like in the beginning, I, I was getting super stressed. For example, when I was assigned some task and like kind of granted this uh, responsibility that I should deliver something. And I just, I just couldn't. I, I constantly had these panic attacks that I don't know what I'm doing. And the thing which amplifies this stress is if the person who you want to ask things is super busy, just like you mentioned, this manager, for example. And can you maybe tell a bit more? How can we handle those situations other than work hard, obviously, and try to do things? Maybe you have some things from your experience. Uh, yeah, there, there are various things. I think it starts with the, you got to build up the confidence. So I am confident that I'm a good engineer. Um, I'm, I am I'm confident in my skills, in my capabilities, and that this manifests in various ways. So, I, I mean, you hear a lot, honestly, it's, uh, I hear, you hear a lot about the imposter syndrome, this and that. I, I had, it, I don't, I didn't experience that. That much, to be honest. Sometimes, like I'm kind of ashamed to say that, but I, I, I cannot say that I experienced that. The reason is that, like, every time I don't know something, my my intuition is to find someone that knows it, 
you know, like I don't start thinking, oh my God, I don't know, I'm bad. No, my thinking is, okay, I don't know. But I got to find the person that knows it. And I realized talking to people is way faster than surfing internet or reading documentation. I can spend, there'll be, there'll be cases that I spend like days on um, going through the code and reading documentation. And then I literally spoke to someone for 15 minutes and everything was clear. So people underestimate the importance of communication and the importance of asking good questions. I always, my, my approach to any, any meeting, any update, any conversation is not to what I can say. It's about what I can get out of it, what kind of information I can get out of it. So I come in with the not information that I'm going to share, but I come in with the questions that I have. That's, that's, that's like the basics where I start with. And because of that, I build a good confidence that, okay, I may not know something that you want me to do, but I have a really good skills of finding someone that knows and learning from them. So this helps a lot to be confident in my abilities. And when I, when I get stuck um, or, or, you know, like my progress is not as fast as I wish. So, so I started thinking, okay, how, how, how do I overcome this? Who is the person, this and that, this is one thing. Another thing is, uh, when, when, when there is a lot of, like you mentioned, um, yeah, you understand that you should not worry about the things that you cannot control, but you still do, right? It's the same with me too. I mean, I cannot, I cannot, uh, control the outcome, but it still worries. And I understand also that, okay, if the outcome is bad, I'll be really upset. Even though I expect it can be bad, I'm still, I will still be upset. But what I do in this time, just to like, for me, it's escape. It's in a way to, to, to relax. Uh, I just cope. Okay, I'm just going to sit down. I have some more trivial things to fix. Maybe it's not the major aspect of my project. I'm just going to code. You know, I'm, I'm going to do some cleanup, some tech debt reduction, add some tasks, update. The, like, I'm going to have fun with it. You know, I'm going to show. And what I'm good at is engineering. So I'm just going to engineer things. And yeah, if you'll be upset, I'll be upset. If, anyway, it will not be permanent. I will not be permanently upset. Two, three days, yeah, there's going to be next thing. I'm going to move to next thing, whatever. That's yeah, it's like approach. coding, th yeah, coding therapy you do, right? Yeah, it is. Cool. Exactly, it is. Yeah, I, I totally agree and I can totally feel that. And can I, can we talk a bit, like, as you have worked on these multiple production grade systems, uh, how is, does it, uh, how do you kind of release changes and how, how big of a chance is there to break some things in production for you? Maybe you have experienced that as well, but uh, how, uh, what is this failure culture at Google? I mean, how okay are people around you for you to fail and learn from those failures? It's blameless culture, I believe. Um, and I think any organization that tries to build things should have a blameless culture because especially in technologies, the field that is very innovative, you cannot progress without trying things. And when you try things, very often you're going to fail. It's not a fail. Like, I think the fail is the wrong word here. I believe it's, it's learning, right? You got to try 1,000 things and two things work out. And, and that's great. You know, you, you look at the athletes, right? You, you look at the professional teams, even the best athletes, best teams, they don't win literally every game and every, what do you call them? Like failures? No, they just like tried, they learned from it, they tried again, they learned from it. Tried it. So it's a similar approach. So, but if it turn into the blame game, if every time something fails, oh, who's, who's, who's at fault? Okay, why did you do this? Then people will stop taking any initiatives and any risks. So they will just play constantly safe and you will have a very mediocre product. So blameless culture is very important. Uh, I believe in any field, especially in a field like technologies, right? In the software engineering, so it's it's, it's the same philosophy and mindset here. Um, uh, and uh, I I have I have break I yeah I I broke things. Um, I broke on the pixel on. Uh, I, mean, I remember it was a Sunday morning. I got ping that the like voice assistant was not working at all on our um, pixel devices. <laughs> And I just ignored it. I was like, oh, somebody broke it, whatever. I'm just going to check out it on Monday. <laughs> so on a Monday, I came in and I realized that my name was all, all around the place. I was like, why people are bugging me? You know, <laughs> I looked at the CL that broke it and I saw, oh, it was me. I broke it. So what I did, I messed up with some logic. Um, and then it was literally blocking voice assistant. But it never went to full production. It went to what's called dog footing before it goes production. So that's why we have cycles. We start with the 
our release cycles are we start with uh, team footing when when we when we believe that okay it's it's okay to release to dog footing then we include in a dog footing build that we dog food for like two weeks to month it depends um and then we release to production we have on the other side uh, qa um and we instruct qa with every change what needs to be tested um so it's quite rigorous but even 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 though it's quite rigorous there's still uh breakages here and there and some minor or major bugs um so you, you cannot avoid that um we should you should not you should not think that all no one should think that they can write a software that has no bugs the only only code that has no bugs is no code at all so it's totally okay uh you just need to have a good guardrails how how you act when this kind of thing happens so you can fix it quickly um or but yeah, you should not concentrate on failures. Just learn from it, write one, write one page document, whatever, why it happened, how it can be avoided, what you can learn from it, then move on. Yeah, actually, like uh, at some kind of normal and uh, good companies, I really believe that there are like these staging environments where you deploy stuff and it kind of minimizes this production failure things. But like... Uh, Last week, I was talking with one of my friends and he works at startup and they are directly <laughs> deploying things on production and just an ordinary failure happened, which caused him a lot of nerves and stress because he broke stuff in production, company lost some money. And in those cases, obviously, you you should not blame an engineer, but yeah, it's, I, I'm really advocating for those test environments and those yeah. minimizing steps for those because it really can affect kind of mental uh, feelings sure <clears throat> my light decided to switch off automatics <laughs> <laughs> yeah cool and you mentioned this failure in sports and i the one thing which directly hopped into my mind was this when nba reporter is asking yanis i i don't know if you if you have seen this interview yanis is this nba player and their team somehow couldn't get to finals or something and NBA reporter is asking like this is a big fail right and Yanis exactly <laughs> said that so he said that we became champions like last year and do you consider do you think that we should be champions every year I mean it's impossible right so it is. there will be lots of failures and some of them will be success so you never know until you try so yeah, I totally agree. It's, um, even like to go back to the startup uh, example, uh, there are two things. Okay, Google is an established company, right? And the people expect, especially from Google quality, and you, Google has resources to have a rigorous like testing system and the release cycles, and nobody's going to go crazy. For example, Gmail is not getting updated for a month, right? Because people are used to using and they expect reliability rather than uh, some novel functionality from it. Uh, but at the other hand, if you're on a startup, you got to move really fast. And moving really fast means okay, if, if you just hook customers on your product, you got to keep on, you got to keep them uh, on your platform, whatever you're offering with new features, improved qualities and that, right? You move, When you're moving fast, you don't have that much time to a stage certain things, go through dog footing, like testing and then release it. So yeah, it, it, it's totally okay to break things there. I believe like Meta is uh, infamous for it. They don't even, they don't have like testing uh, infrastructure. They just test in production, like majority of things, right? And it's Meta, it's, it's not a small startup, right? It's, it's a massive company that has billions of users. Um, just being comfortable that things will break and comfortable in yourself that you will be able to fix it. Honestly, I mean, honestly, I never heard someone that okay, we broke something and we were never able to fix it. I never heard it. I never heard. Maybe, maybe some, some, sometimes, I don't know, maybe happened somewhere and company went bankrupt. I don't know. But from my personal experience, to the people I've I've spoken to, and I talked to a lot of engineers, I've never heard that. Oh, okay, we got this bug. We were never, we were never able to fix it. So, I'm trusting yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Now I want to ask about the thing, which is like, do you like take the working context with you at home? I, I don't necessarily mean that you work at home as well. 
but inside your head, do you think about some problems to, you worked uh, at working hours or how is that? Yes and no. <laughs> uh, so one thing is my working hours are very, uh, they vary. I don't have, I mean, I, I come to the office every day just because I like coming to the office every day. But sometimes I will come at 6 a.m. Uh, sometimes I will come after lunch and I'll stay really late. Um, and uh, there have been like cases that will come on a weekend. The reason I do and when I do is it exactly when I take the work contacts with me after work, if it's in my head, if I'm thinking about, so I'm just like getting so excited about it, right? That it's at that moment, I lose the sense of that it's work and it's just thing that I want to do. And I get the idea, especially if I'm working on design doc and suddenly I got the like new way of how to implement things. I want to try it out. I mean, I do it at home too, but I have a better infrastructure at work that I can, I can uh, test and run it. And plus it's like more peaceful. Um, so it, it happens quite often. I try to, at the same time, I try to remember that it's still just a job and it's not everything in my life. Uh, and I have a lot of other interests and activities that I engage outside of work. And I don't wanna be constantly consumed by work. Uh, it's just not a healthy. I'm trying to maintain certain balance, but sometimes when when I get excited, I would just, let you know i'll just follow the flow and i'm totally okay with that yeah and actually like uh, i also like have uh, i also struggle to explain these scenarios to non-software engineers and sometimes <laughs> to software engineers as well because like at that moment it's not about work it's about that problem and you and just th that excitement which is like i mean you know i, I totally get yeah. what you mean so yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay yeah. uh uh, the one one thing I really uh, want to ask about uh, as well is um, this kind of feedback loop of engineers at Google. Okay, I mean, to me, like it's super important to know after some time how how well I'm doing because sometimes it's not that obvious. I might think that I'm doing well, but I I, I, I might need some feedback from others. So how does that happen uh, at Google for you? Mm -hmm. So. There's okay. There are two parts. You have you have manager. So if you're in uh, IC individual contributor like engineer, uh, you will have manager, uh, and then you have weekly or biweekly meetings, uh, and then you have quarterly reviews and then annual review. And there's uh, beyond that you have like if you're preparing for promotion, this and that, that the certain things need to be done. Um, the one the managers should be communicating with you, so there should not be any surprises about your performance review. So before you get the results for your performance review, you should be um, you, you should know what you're gonna get there. So if you're not performing well, uh, managers should be checking in with you, telling you, okay, first of all, what, what what's going on? Why? You know, what is there blockers? Is something going on? Like how can I help you to to unblock you to to so you can perform at the level that I know you can perform, right? Um, so there's one aspect of it, but. Um, if constantly, so my philosophy in everything is I don't expect, I never expect the others going to do something for me. Okay. I go out and I do it. You know, if I want to get some information from someone, I don't expect they're going to send me this information. I'm going to go out, ask them and get it. But similarly, I approach my one on ones is two, two things. I always, uh, at the like, top of the things is always asking, what are our team's priorities? That's where I start. Right. If I can, if I, if I'm doing things that uh, is important for our team and I'm delivering things that is important for our team, I mean, obviously nobody going to come to me and tell me that, oh, you're not performing well. Right. Because I've seen people get captivated with certain things, doing a lot of work in certain areas that were not important at all. And they were surprised that, oh, but I'm, I'm productive. Okay. Productive. Yeah. You are productive. Maybe you're writing a lot of code or dying, but does it affect the bottom line? You know, does it does it help the business to go in the direction? Does it help the team to go in the direction we want to go? So you need to be aligned. So I always communicate. I always ask, uh, what what do you want me to like? Okay, I have preference. I believe this is important work to do. Do you agree with this one? Do you want me to continue working on this one? Right. So I get this kind of feedback from my manager. And then the other thing is because Google is really big company. Um, it's really hard to get noticed, right? It's amazing engineers. Every team I worked on, amazing engineers. 
they can build anything that you can you tell them so how do you stand out like how do you manage even in this competitive environment you grow so the, this part is again how you put yourself out you got to market yourself right so uh doing um design reviews uh right? team-wide design reviews uh to demonstrate what you're working on and also use the proper verbiage like why it is important that you're doing this one right because they have no idea what you work like nobody if you own like two three people around your team in the especially big company like Google has the idea what you're doing and why it is important. So anytime you like this is gonna be my advice. Anytime you say that I did something, you should answer the question, so what? Okay. You did something, so what? You know, okay. How it helped this, how it helped that, how it improved this one because of this. Like you should explain and answer this question. So be proactive, take your career in your hands, don't expect that someone gonna you know, do it for you and the rest will follow. Uh, okay, great. And you mentioned this uh, IC software engineers and uh, uh, I'm really curious, like, uh, do you collaborate with your team or you just have some standalone tasks which you do or how, how does that happen in your daily job? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously the majority of my work is, uh, especially when I'm writing code, um, to just write the code on my own. Probably that's like a 60, 70% of my work. But because Google's code base is so huge, there's always overlap some other teams, right? Uh, it starts with overlap some other teammates. So if you own, for example, we own anything that relates to platform uh, on a Google TV. Um, so every time I, I make any changes, there are other what's called the subject matter experts. Um, so I kind of communicate with them not necessarily ask their permission or something because I also own the same thing. So uh, I, I have a good, good design doc and they are well aligned what I'm doing. So this one aspect is I'm, I'm, uh, my work is overlapping with my team members and we have like uh, weekly updates. We don't do daily standups. I think it's the biggest waste of time. So we do weekly just to you know, get in sync. Uh, if there's specific needs to work on solution with some other teammate, yeah, I'll just schedule one one with him. And then there is um, um, a collaboration with other teams. It's very important, like one of the aspects that uh, can uh, lead you to into software engineer, SAIC, is how much influence you have on other team, how much, how much influence you have on other teams and how much uh, changes your code or your project brought on overall product area, not only necessarily your team. So having a good relationship with other teams and other teams tech leads is very important. Every time you overlap, they, you guys need to like agree and this and that. So yeah, there's a lot of collaboration going here. So everyone that is engineer, I would advise to work on the communication skills. Okay. And what about like this uh, smart people society around you? you work at, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you kind of leverage that? I mean, do you like uh, talk a lot with them? I mean, how how, how is this? Uh, there are obviously <laughs> a lot of smart people right around you and yeah. great engineers. And do you like use that opportunity to kind of socialize with them, do some networking or how do you do that? Uh, I personally do, but honestly, outside of work, not many, many, uh, many engineers do that, which I notice. And it's... Um, you better do that. So there's two things. First, for me, it's honestly exciting knowing how much thing I can learn uh, from these people. And especially you find people with 10, 15 years of uh, Google experience and they build amazing things and their tribal knowledge is just beyond comprehensible. So for me, every time I get in a room with someone like that, uh, I, I just uh, like, tons of questions and i ask about everything i ask even even when i know what to do i will ask their opinion um if I'm, i may not necessarily do as they suggest uh and but if they give me their opinion i would listen to it and then i will in return tell them why i decided not to use it also so they also don't think that oh they just wasted time telling me something, but you don't have to always agree to them. But uh, it's it's a great way to learn a lot of stuff. And for me, uh, knowing that the, my teammates are just really good engineers, uh, 
actually gives me more confidence in, in doing what I do. If I make a mistake, they will notice it. You know that this kind of I, I have this kind of um, approach. And then if I don't know something, someone in my team or other team will know it. So I'll just go and ask them. Uh, so you should, everyone should embrace and they should try to get around the people that um, they are believe better than themselves. So that's the only way how you can grow. If you're always the best, the smartest or most experienced around you, I mean, yeah, it's good to give it back, but how do you grow, right? So there should be at least a couple of uh, people around you that, uh, that that can teach you things. And yeah, network, maintain good relationship. Be respectful, genuinely care. I genuinely care about my teammates. You know, I spend at least 40 hours with them, right, per week. And I guess if someone is not feeling well, I'm just going to ask them, you know, how are you doing? What's going on? This and that. So it's very basic human things that going to, trust me, pay you well in the future. Yeah, just simple human engineering, right? Yeah. It's, yeah, uh, good. They're social animals, so. <laughs> yeah, sure. And... uh we can kind of go to the kind of final part of our conversation now. And now I really want to ask, uh, so obviously like this daily job is a huge part of software, software engineer's life, right? But first I want to ask, what are some software engineer things which you do other than your daily job? Are there any such things? Maybe you will learn some stuff or do some other things. Uh, I kind of missed the final part. Uh, if there are any activities outside of, my daily job. Okay, let me ask the question again. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the thing is that, like, obviously, the daily job is a huge part of software engineers' mm -hmm. life, right? But to my understanding, like, I've met a lot of software engineers who like don't stop at their work after after their work, and they still maybe learn some new things. They still get involved in software engineering as a side hustle. And do you do those kind of things? Maybe you don't have time or How's that situation for you? Yeah, I like to learn outside of work, not necessarily things that relate to work, but also just out of genuine curiosity. Uh, one of the things that led me to work on the Gen AI right now is because I was very interested in LLMs when it started taking off. And I read a couple of books um, outside of Google. Uh, I even wrote some uh, posts about it, uh, like how can you build it from scratch? I experimented on my own. I, I, I never did that in order to use it at work. I was just genuinely curious. And when it happened that there were some opportunities here, I was the one of the best candidates for it because I had the familiarity with it. So yeah, I like to, um, especially I like textbooks. I like going through the book and following examples. And uh, what I do is I would, whatever the textbook programming language they have, I would, use, I would try to implement everything in Rust. So that, that's kind of my exercise. <laughs> <laughs> you have fun with the learning but yeah I like in general I like to learn not only necessarily program related stuff I always read something more informative educative it, that 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 um you know exercises my my brain it's it's like you can treat it as like a muscle you, it, if, if it doesn't if you're reading something and it's not thought provoking right if you're reading just like an autopilot I would suggest to read something else <laughs> Okay, great. And what about like completely not non-tech things? Like uh, how much of those things you do in your kind of life? Some other oh, stuff. Oh, okay. Uh, that's um mm -hmm. um I still have appreciation for architecture. Uh so I like to explore um cities or interesting designs. I I love I I I love so music, books, and movies. Uh, I play guitar myself. Uh, I have like, movie nights, uh, and especially I love French New Wave, like sixties and seventies French movies. So I, I try to, like, I, I try to be multidimensional person, um, the exploring in, in, in various ways beyond my profession and technology. Uh, to remain human, <laughs> uh, so I think those those what is called uh, our some people call it soul, some people call it I don't know internals, whatever it is, right? To feed that uh, desire, and I like sports. You know, I like basketball, I like soccer. I played basketball for a very long time, and here and there when I need to uh, improve, like 
get in a little bit better shape. I usually go to basketball and not just the weightlifting. Yeah, and one last thing, like uh, the place where I just heard about you and you heard about me was obviously LinkedIn, where you share a lot of cool insights, tech insights based on your experience. And I really encourage everyone to follow Becca on LinkedIn. Thank you. So can you can you tell me about that activity? I mean, is it some kind of a therapy or you just enjoy giving back? Yeah, so I learned a lot of stuff from random strangers on the internet. <laughs> uh, I, on, on Reddit, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, right? And people will, and when I would ask questions, they will, like nobody asked, nobody required, nobody paid them, but they will give me very insightful, very detailed responses. They started following, they will create the content, very informative, educative. I believe in um, accumulation of knowledge and accumulation of knowledge is only possible through the sharing of knowledge. So when I learn something, when I encounter something, experience something, I believe there'll be at least one person that may benefit from it. So I'm, I'm doing my part in that matter. Um, our any kind of effort should be a collective effort if we want to if we want to keep moving forward, improving the world around us, right? So I'm doing my small part in it. So that's why I like to hear. Now, that's one thing. The another thing is I like written communication, and that's the skill I'm constantly working on. Uh, you need to be able to influence through not only verbal but also the written communication. So LinkedIn is the amazing way to practice that uh, frequently. And the third thing is in an age of internet, so you got to have some footprint, I believe. Um, so for example, my activity on LinkedIn led me to several interesting, not only connections, but also opportunities. I uh, decided not to pursue them, but people reached out. I, I also have like personal page, we would say like blog that I like, I don't update that often now, but here and there, I would just post more longer, uh, like technical tutorials or opinions. And uh, I had the opportunity before joining Google, for example, one, one hiring manager just so liked my introduction on my personal page. Uh, he invited me directly on the like a final stage of the interview. There was no technical interview with just the chat and then he gave me an offer. So you never know what's going to bring it. So this kind of having your footprint and representation in a way, like, some people call it like branding. I don't, I don't like calling it branding. I'm trying to be as genuine as I can because at the end of the day, you, you cannot pretend. Like, yeah, you can pretend for like short amount of time, but at the end of the day, it will come out and you will come out as fake if you try to play uh, the character that you are not. So I'm trying to be genuine. I like to put humor um, because, I mean, we're, we're, without the humor world, is really dark and gloomy place. So we got to be able to laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and like one of my guests in previous podcasts said that it's like expose yourself to randomness i mean and you never know what world holds for you so well said. thank you they come of course I guess my that pleasure was it. i had blast i had blast talking to you so thank you very much and yeah that's Enjoy it too thank you very much for inviting and uh best of luck to you